You need to show them that you understand the problem that they have. And they need to believe that you might be able to solve it. They don't need to believe that you can. They don't need to believe that you have it all figured out. They don't need to believe any of that. They just need to believe that you understand their problem and you may be able to solve it. So this is why I think our movement assessment, by the way, for personal trainers is so valuable because there's so many reps in the gym of people doing things that you can help them improve on. And having an appropriate movement screen can be a really easy way in to have those conversations. But the point is, find a problem, agree they have it, and become someone they believe might be able to solve it. Now, what kind of role playing do you want to do? At Active Life, we believe that the healthcare clinic of the future is the gym. Everybody starts with the best case scenario in mind. Never sell anything to anybody who is not in the market for what you have. The only reason we work out is to create the opportunity to recover. And the healthcare provider of the future is the coach. And this is why you guys need to get paid well, because what you're doing is really, really hard work. Welcome back to another episode of Turning Pro on the Active Life Podcast. I'm Larry Geyer, and we're here with Dr. Sean Pestuch. Good morning. Today, we are going to talk to personal trainers in commercial gyms. I was one for a long time. It's where my career was born. And I want to make sure that you guys see clear guidelines to how you can fill a book of business. Dr. Sean, you also started as a personal trainer at a commercial gym, didn't you? Yeah, and I, I actually attribute much of our success as a company to my experience that I had as a trainer in a commercial gym and the mentorship that I got from my management there. How can a trainer in a commercial gym who you know, may like certain things about the gym, may dislike certain things about the gym, but who has anywhere from, I don't know, 500 to 5,000 members there, mm -hmm. fill a book of business with clients that they want to work with to the point that they're making the kind of income that allows them to say, hey, this is my full-time job. Let's, can we take a step back before we go there? Sure. I recently sent a text message to my personal training manager who was the first person who ever hired me in a real, in, at Equinox, which was not like your mom and pop commercial gym where everything was falling apart. You guys have eucalyptus towels, don't you? We did. Not in the beginning. There were no eucalyptus towels in the beginning. Um, but we did have towels. And I made a habit and a career of handing them out. So his name was Joshua Harrison. It still is. And I texted him the other day because I was thinking about my experience there as I was coming in to uh, our Tuesday last week where we educate a team of trainers in a commercial gym. And... I sent him a text and I said, I just want to let you know, I was thinking about you today and I appreciate the opportunity that you gave me in bringing me on staff back in 2005 to the club in Great Neck, which is a town in New York. The lessons that I learned from you during our on-ramp before the gym was even open have influenced the way I do just about everything in my business and I would not be the professional that I am today had it not been for the influence that you had in 2005, even if I'm still gleaning some of that uh, experience and that thought for the first time now. He's a really good dude and I'm sure he appreciated that message very much. He did. He, he, yeah, he wrote back. It was, it was kind. It was nice. So when you're a personal trainer in a commercial gym, it's hard to acquire new clients if you don't have a strategy to acquire new clients. It's especially hard if you're unsure who should be a client and who should not be a client. You follow me? Mm -hmm. So one of the most valuable things that Joshua taught me when I was a very new personal trainer, like less than a year into personal training in 2005, was he taught us to respect our time and to know who we wanted to work with in the gym and to figure out who we wanted to work with in the gym by working with everybody. So his thought was instead of going out and trying to figure out what's the kind of client you like to train, how do you like to train them? What equipment do you like to use? Do you like older men to train? Do you like older women? Do you like younger women, younger men, athletes, non-athletes? He's like spot everybody. Spot everybody. Have conversations with everybody. Respect your time in that you're in the gym on time. Mm -hmm. You leave the gym on time. And if you're in the gym off of your schedule, you are appearing professional because that's time you're spending on display for all of the people in the gym. Respect your time. Respect yourself. And say yes to everybody until you figure out who you want to say yes to. Mm -hmm. And 
that was really valuable advice because when I first started working in the gym, they teach you at Equinox, it's going to take about six months to become a full-time trainer. Full-time is 21 training sessions per week paid. And that's if you get there at all. <clears throat> I got there in five weeks. And I got there in five weeks in large part due to Josh's advice to see everybody around you as an opportunity to expect that the people who you're talking to on the floor are going to say yes to you. If you ask them if they would like to do more, that the people who you offer a spot to are going to say yes. The people you offer a towel to are going to say yes, and they're going to value you because you did it. He taught me to look for opportunities and to expect them to be in front of me. And that was a huge fundamental shift from what I had learned previous, which was most people are going to tell you no. Be really careful about who you go up to and speak to. You follow me? Yeah, huge difference. Yeah, so <clears throat> the number one way that I filled my book of business as a trainer at Equinox in five weeks was I was there. I was there. I spoke to everybody. I, I knew, like, just like you, we've talked about your experience at New York Sports Club. I knew their names. I knew their spouse's name. I knew where they lived, not their address, but the town they lived in. I knew if they had kids, how many kids, what sports their kids played. I knew all of these things. I knew if they liked a the towel when they worked out. I wouldn't go ask Jen Schwartz, for example, one of my favorite clients I ever had. She bought us, she bought perfume. For, I used to tell her she smelled so good. So she bought the perfume for my wife. I brought it home for Kim. And I was like, hey, look, my client Jen, who I tell you about all the time, <clears throat> she bought you this perfume. Kim smelled it. And she's like, oh, I hate this. <laughs> like, okay. So we returned it to Bergdorf Goodman, which was a store I'd never heard of before. I don't know if you've heard of Bergdorf mm -hmm. Goodman. So we get there. Oh, yeah, of course you've heard of Joseph yeah, works yeah. Out, yeah. So we get there, and I walk, we walk in, and you want to talk about being out of place? They offer us a personal shopper. I'm like, what, would it, what, would it, what, it, what does that mean? What does a personal shopper mean? It sounds great, by the way. Yeah, it sounds amazing. But how, like, do I pay this person? Um, how do they know what I like? like do you have to go in for that? I don't know. I mean, at the time, it was 2006. I, I don't Got know it. what the deal is today. But- this little bottle, it was like one ounce of perfume. It was $160. Mm. And I, I, I'm off track, but the reason I got there is because Jen bought me that because I took a genuine interest in her before she was my client, while she was my client. She referred me four other clients while she was my client. One of them before she was my client to test me. But... All that aside, I knew Jen, everybody Jen in the gym. Jen smart. Jen was a boss. <laughs> I, w I used to laugh and joke around with her because she'd be like, my son only wears things that are black with skull and crossbones on them. He like won't wear anything else. And I'm like, how old is your son? She's like, three. I'm like, you're buying the clothes. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Oh, they got lost. So anyway, um, my point is, I remember coming up to Jen Three times in a row, distinctly. I, I can remember exactly where she was on the elliptical in the back right corner. If you're looking at the cardio equipment at the Equinox I was at, she was back right corner on the elliptical. And I would ask her, would you like a towel? No, thank you. Okay. Second day, would you like a towel? No, thank you. Third day, would you like a towel? And she said to me, I never want a fucking towel. I was like, oh, okay. So I now knew... I don't need to go up to Jen and offer her a towel anymore. But I should go up to Jen and offer her something. I should have conversation with Jen about something. And it was a little lesson that enabled me to, I was in the gym all the time. I wanted to know what do these people want? What don't these people want? And just getting to know these people and have conversations with them about it allowed me to one day have a conversation with Jen and laugh about her telling me I never want a fucking towel. And it was easier for me to ask her if she wanted to train with me. So... The easiest way to fill your book of business as a trainer in a gym is to be there, to, to be helpful, to be the person who other people in the gym want to be around. And when you're working with a client, even if you're spotting them, full intention, full attention. You talk about this. Maybe you can expand on it. Um, the difference between being there and being there. Well, people can smell your intent, right? I mean, if you're, if you're walking around with the intention, like, all right, so I'm got to do what Dr. Sean is saying and I got to go collect my reps of talking to people. That's true. But if you go in with the intention of, I need to say enough right things and maybe I'll be able to push the buy button for on them today. It's, I think that's the wrong way to do yeah. it. What you were describing doing was going in and saying, you are literally going to 10 X 
enhance their experience at the gym. And that's all you're going to focus on Mm -hmm. every single day, everyone. And when the opportunity presents itself, that this is someone that you should lead further down the line in conversation because it will, because it's always in front of you, then you will take it. Mm -hmm. Huge difference in thinking. Yeah. And you know, what, the, the number one thing that you need to be able to do as a trainer to get somebody to opt into working with you beyond conversationally and as a friend, as someone who trusts and likes you in the gym, is you need to show them that they have a problem and they need to believe that you might be able to solve it. That's it. That's it. So, so stop trying to sell somebody on the floor. It's not where it happens. Want to role play? In a second. You need to show them that you understand the problem that they have. And they need to believe that you might be able to solve it. They don't need to believe that you can. They don't need to believe that you have it all figured out. They don't need to believe any of that. They just need to believe that you understand their problem and you may be able to solve it. So this is why I think our movement assessment, by the way, for personal trainers is so valuable because there's so many reps in the gym of people doing things that you can help them improve on. And having an appropriate movement screen can be a really easy way in to have those conversations. But the point is, find a problem, Agree they have it and become someone they believe might be able to solve it. Now, what kind of role playing do you want to do? You be the trainer on the floor and I'm going to be a client and you're going to identify a problem. Show them what you're talking about. Can we flip? Sure. I don't want to. I'm not trying to sell right now. Okay. All right. What are you working on? Uh, let's just pretend I just finished doing a bunch of shoulder presses with a, with a, like one of those fixed barbells. Mm. It's. They, they, they're on the rack. It's like 10 pounds, or not 10 pounds, but like 20 pounds would be at the top, and then it goes all the way down to 50 on one side. And I'd, all the way down I'd to be working on the 10 pounds. Maybe you would be. But so let's let's say I'm, I'm pressing the 40-pound weight, and I'm, I'm my technique just looks off. Okay. So are you, are you demonstrating any discomfort? Are you just, it just looks like you're working hard. It looks like it's not I'm really... Not, I'm not demonstrating discomfort because I think a lot of the trainers who are going to listen to this don't necessarily feel confident that they can fix discomfort. So let's talk about an area where they're very confident that they can be excellent. Perfect. So you're doing a shoulder press and mm-hmm. it just doesn't. I'm just leaning back. Right. I'm not finishing the rep. And, you know, I, as far as I know, I'm doing a good job. Perfect. Okay. So you finished your last I just, rep. I just finished the last rep. I put the weight back on the rack. I'm looking in the mirror, kind of like not flexing, but flexing. You know what I'm talking Got about. It. Hey, doing overhead work today? Yes. Got it. Yes. My name's Larry. I think I've seen you around a couple of times. You walk in you walk in with the golden lab sometimes, right? That you yes. let your wife yes, take away. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. And cool. I have seen you. Yeah, I've seen you on the floor cool. a lot. How many I'm uh, Sean, by the way. Nice to meet you. How many sets of those are you doing today? Uh my my I'm doing five sets of eight reps today. Got it. Do you feel that uh at the top of your rep you're finding yourself leaning back a lot? I don't know if that's something you were aware of or not. Uh, I, I did notice it a little bit, but I never really, like, is that a problem? I mean, I... Is there any discomfort that you're experiencing? No, with? I feel fine. Got it. So the only reason I pointed it out is that a lot of times when we start to lean back at the end of a rep there, a lot of the work that you're trying to do for your shoulders is actually starting to be done by your lower back. And I'm not necessarily insinuating that you have any issues with that. I'm just saying that I think that what you're trying to train in your upper body is actually starting to shift away towards something you're not trying to train. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess uh, that's interesting. So, so w- what would you recommend can, I do? Can I show you a little something that I like to try when this totally, happens to yeah. me? All right, so take this dumbbell instead, and let's just work one side at a time for a second. Can you show me that you can stay tall first and just press this all the way to the top without shifting back at all? Try a couple reps there. Tell me what you feel. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that... that Perfect. Okay. I mean, I've, I've pressed a dumbbell before. No issues with that? No. Great. So what I want you to try to do now is let's go back to the barbell that you were using. I want to shave 10 pounds off just for technique first. Mm-hmm. Try this and see if you can get this to the top at the same range of motion you were working without leaning back at all. Tell me what you feel. Okay. Um, I mean, that, that, that it definitely feels a little different. I feel a little more in the front of the shoulder, especially at the top. I'm getting a little tired a little bit faster. Perfect. Uh, maybe it would be even harder with a heavier weight, but yeah, so you can imagine how that would be. Yeah, a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you can feel your shoulders are working a little bit harder here. Yep. Even at this lighter weight, you can see how you're getting more with your shoulders. Yeah. I would recommend that you try weights here, that you can squeeze more juice for your shoulder without having to put your low back at that risk. Try your five sets of eight. Next time you come in, it doesn't even have to be today, and just see how that goes for you. Okay. Cool. Thank you, Larry. Yeah, any questions you have about that, let me know. Great. And this can just be one of five conversations that you have with this person in the gym. Well, so let's, let's break the role pair right now, mm-hmm. make sure that we're clear that we're talking about it. Why didn't you try to sell me? Because I don't necessarily have something that I need to be selling you right now. If I can create a piece of value that you can immediately take away, if you, the next time you come in and you press overhead, have a categorically different experience, and you're more sore in your shoulders than you've ever been when you've done this, and you maybe even feel better, and you notice that you didn't have a certain discomfort that you had in the past, you can make, man, 
Larry really knows how to help me with this. So, so when do you go in for the sale? If there have been enough of those conversations or when someone is indicating to me that they'd really like some guidance on something, if let's say, for example, I've approached you three times, right? Mm -hmm. For three totally different things. You've just given me. Given just me, given, 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 give, given, given, given. Hey, let me know. I'll see you around. Nice to see you. Hey, but how's it going today? Are you working on this today? Got it. After I've given you three of those and there are multiple opportunities, it's like, hey, man, I love giving you all these tips, but it's I was thinking about you the other day because it's been frustrating to me that I haven't been able to help you much more comprehensively. If I made the time in my schedule to take a look at you head to toe and see what kind of opportunity there is for you to build a program that's going to help you in a much bigger way, would you like that? Yeah. And if the person says yes to that, then we're in there. Yeah. If, if the person is like, yeah, it's, this has always been an issue for me. And, um, I even experience you know, some problems trying to do this, that, or the other thing. What do you, what can we do about that? And they're indicating that they really like help. It was well, this something that you would really like to prioritize creating a, a solution around or no. And mm -hmm. if they indicate yes, then it's sell them. Yeah. And I'd like to add to that, that, um, when, when you're in this situation, you're, you're demonstrating value over and over and over again. The fear that a lot of trainers have is if I don't sell this person sessions today, somebody else is going to sell them sessions and the, the effort that I put into them is going to be for not in rare, very rare commercial gyms. And when I say commercial gyms, I'm talking about the gyms where you join to have access to the equipment and there are trainers working the floor who can help you as a personal training client. And there are probably some group classes, your equinoxes, your golds, your EOS fitness, all, th those kinds of gyms in rare examples there is really good culture amongst the trainers where all of the trainers are looking to make all of the trainers better. And they're looking to understand that they all represent each other and they want to be great. In most, I understand you feel like you're in competition with everybody else on staff and you probably are understand that if you walk over to somebody with the kind of intention that you described and you do it just once, Every other experience that that person has with a trainer who would be interested in selling them a session is going to be compared to the experience that they had with you. And they may be making buying decisions when they're working with somebody else that are, I would never work with this other person because it wasn't as good as the experience I had with Larry. Mm -hmm. And the next time Larry talks to me, I'm actually going to ask him if he'll train me because now I understand how good he is. You know, two weeks ago, you... um for those of you who are like, but even approaching someone around that, around what I think they should do is scary. I've been there, right? Uh, imagine for my personal trainers in commercial gyms right now, imagine the really, really, really jacked person or really, really experienced looking person who looks like they are 40 years plus and you're like 24 years old right now, right? Wow. 22. How do I approach this person and tell them what I think they should be doing? If you are not currently at the point where you want to create, where you feel confident enough suggesting what someone should do, here's another really easy way to approach them first. So you're the kind of person that they want to talk to. Two episodes ago, Dr. Sean, you referred to how to have a conversation, a more collaborative conversation with a doctor and how you go there with the intention of learning and being educated instead of approaching to try to convince the person, yeah. right? You can have the same thing with an experienced gym rat. You know, the person who's been in the gym for 20 years, you can see them. And when you approach that person, the first conversation you have doesn't have to be a sale of an idea. It can be asking them a question so that you can enhance your education. Mm -hmm. I think the worst thing the trainers can do is try to sell someone the first time they meet them. I agree. I think that it's, it's understandable why you want to do it. It feels like it's a faster way to get to where you're trying to go. It's not. Hey, it's, I've been, I've been watching your, your set and your rep schemes and I've never seen it done like this before. What do you, what are you getting out of this? I'm, I'm really just want to learn a better way that I can apply some stuff for my clients and be genuine. Yeah. Like it, don't make what, it up. Right. I want to be clear. That doesn't mean walk over to somebody who you think that you you're better than <laughs> And be like, hey, I saw you doing this. Can you teach me something? And they're like, yeah, this. And you're like, oh, actually, that's not true. Let me teach you this, this. And you should sign up with me. No, that's that's being a douche. That's not good. So it's have genuine curiosity. Take the opportunity to learn from somebody who might be able to teach you something. Mm -hmm. If you see someone on a lat pull-down machine and at the bottom of their rep, they can't finish it unless they fall entirely back with their body weight. And now they're doing a horizontal row. You could ask them, hey, does, or, does the lean back, is the lean back intentional? Are you trying to hit a certain mm -hmm. part? It's just learning. I'll never forget. Um, I still have a very good relationship with this client I had in the gym. His name is Josh Goodleman. Josh, if you're listening, he's not listening. <laughs> <laughs> Who am I kidding? Josh is not listening to a, a fitness professional podcast. He owns a very successful marker company. Anyway, I was trying to learn so aggressively, so intently 
that when I would call a new member, I, we used to get these member profiles. So when somebody would join the gym, you would get a profile that they join the gym and call them and see if they want to book their free training assessment, their Equifit. One of the questions on the Equifit was, are you pregnant? And Josh was the first male Equifit I ever, like the first male member profile I ever got. And I'm like, I'm going to do things by the book. I'm at Equinox. This is where things happen. I'm, I'm going to follow their procedure. I ask him question number one, you know, any history of diabetes? No. Any history of cancer? No. Any heart disease? No. Uh, any possibility you're pregnant right now? And he was like, uh, that would be really interesting. No, I don't. I, I think I'm good on the pregnancy. I'm like, hey, I just gotta ask the questions on the sheet. You know, I was that intent about asking everything that I thought they wanted me to say, and I just think that that's a valuable way for trainers, no matter how experienced they are, to be. Don't ask the question about pregnancy to a male when you're calling them, but assume that you don't know and assume that you can learn from somebody else, and you probably will. Huge. That's all I got for you guys. I hope that's a valuable understanding of how you can start to approach people and understand that you don't have to be going around saying, how do I sell someone? How do I sell someone? How do I sell someone? It's how do I make someone's experience more valuable? How do I make someone's experience more valuable? How do I make someone's experience more valuable? And what can I learn from this person right now? Yep. And when you are ready to move to the sales conversation, go back to episode 001 where we talk about the six magical questions to get you guys. Turn pro. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Active Life Podcast. If you did, please be sure to head to wherever you listened to it and give us a quality review as well as five stars if you can spare them. If you want more from us, feel free to follow all of our social media accounts at Active Life Professional, Active Life Rx, and Dr. Sean Pastuch on Instagram. Remember, at Active Life, we believe that the healthcare clinic of the future is the gym and the healthcare provider of the future is the coach. We also believe that that future is now. Time to